Um, it is really a, just a dream for me to be able to be here, see many faces I know, some I don't, um, just to be able to come. And I told our church back home in Gilbert that we were going to, or I was going to be able to be here, and uh, they were all real excited, anxious to hear a report back of everything that's happening. This is so fun to be able to see Grace Church beginning in a room like this. What a, what a dream. This is, this is astounding. This is amazing. Um, we prayed for this, and here it is happening um, for many years. And uh, it, it is, I'm on, one of the things I've told everybody at some point is that one of the things that I am most excited about when we talk about our church is that now our church has a story connected with yours. Um, that, you know, you can't tell the story of our church without Grace Church in Peoria. In fact, I was doing that just this morning. I was talking to some people who were visiting our church and they said, um, have you guys ever planted a church? And I said, well, yes, actually. Um, and I'm going there today. Uh, Peoria, Arizona. And uh, bless myself, yeah, I am definitely motivated to do that. Right here? Sweet. All right. Cool. So anyway, I, it, it's, it's, there's not a, not a day that goes by that I don't pray for you guys. We are an hour away, but... You know, we're right here with you in our hearts. I mean, it's just thrilling to be able to be here. Um, and again, thank you so much for doing the hard work of planting a church, setting up chairs and um, doing the child care and setting up this room and then soon to set up Rio Vista. It's going to be hard, difficult, but glorious at the same time. And these are the days you're going to be able to look back on someday and say, yeah, I was there. Um, how fun that is. I mean, we don't have anybody left at our church who can say, yeah, I was there then. <laughs> they're all over. <laughs> I don't over. That's probably a bad way to discuss people, but they're not there. Um, so, but you all have the stories and the pictures and, and the memories that you're building now. So that's just so cool. So thank you again. Um, and, um, and, and also, you, I can say whatever I want about Chris because he's not here. Um, <laughs> But seriously, he is a, I am so grateful, not only that we were able to plant a church here, but that, that not only that you all came, but that Chris was able to lead the church plant. I mean, he is a godly man who has integrity, um, serious integrity. His family is a wonderful example of a godly family. His wife is a wonderful example of a godly wife. They live evangelism. They live the gospel. Um, I've, I've known Chris a long time, and he's been talking about his passion to plant a church for years. And so I couldn't, I mean, I seriously, it, it is a serious, it's wonderful to be able to plant a church, but it's especially, especially meaningful to be able to have Chris be the one that, from our team, goes and plants here in Peoria. So um, our church, once, our church is waiting to know when we can come. Because if I said, go visit, we would, be, we would fill up this room. Um, because I have people coming up to me all the time saying, when can we go see them? And I said, not yet. Um, and so Chris is supposed to get me the date. So I guess it's between August 9th and August 30th, when you guys go public. That, um, so Chris, let us know. We're waiting. So anyway, um, but Chris is getting some vacation here, so uh, I get the honor to be able to come. So uh, let's, today we're going to talk about evangelism, like Todd mentioned, um, and we're going to look at 2 Corinthians. So if you have your Bibles, open up, if you would, to 2 Corinthians. Um, and uh, I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. And if you can stand, we're going to stand and honor the Lord by recognizing that I'm going to say a lot of different things, but none of it's going to be as impacting as this right here, because this is Holy Scripture. So listen as I read Holy Scripture. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors. We are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So ends the reading of God's word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your work on our behalf, primarily in the way that you met us in the gospel. And Lord, I pray that you would help me to be able to preach clearly, and I pray that you would help me to be able to open up your word. And Lord, I pray that all of us would walk away ready, able, willing to share. And in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, recently, uh, my check engine light came on in my car. Um, and usually, well, in the past, I used to drive cars that that meant nothing because it was always on. Um, other times, one time it flicked on and then my transmission literally blew up on the freeway and I had trouble getting home. Uh, but this time, so, so that experience on the freeway taught me to be, well, to respect the check engine light, honestly. Um, and so when the check engine light came on, I immediately called the mechanic and got my car over for him to look at it. And, you know, I'm, I'm expecting hundreds of dollars. Check engine lights, you know, you don't mess with those. And so they run the diagnostic, they hook my car up to the computer, and he comes back to me and he says, the gas cap wasn't on tight enough. <laughs> like, wow, that's not checking the engine. That's checking the gas cap. We need another light for that. Um, so you can see how well I know cars. Um, but, you know, there are times we think we know what something means, but in reality we don't. I thought the check engine light meant certain doom for my car. Um, but upon further review, we find that really it means something different, maybe something like a gas cap needing to be tightened up. So this morning, as we, uh, sorry, this afternoon, I'm going to do that again, I'm sure. This afternoon, as we talk about evangelism, we've got to start with the concept of the world. We have to talk about how do we love the world. And you know, for centuries, many people have thought, the way, uh, many people have thought that loving, loving the world was a contradiction in terms, something that we couldn't do as Christians, because loving the world meant that you had to disobey Scripture in their mind. First John chapter 2, verse 15 says that you're not, called, you're not supposed to love the world or anything in the world because anyone who loves the world doesn't have the love of Christ in him. And so and we can see this reflected in some of the way people thought in the past. There's monasteries and convents set up to sort of off in, the, off in the woods or high in the mountains in different places to be able to kind of separate themselves from the world because there was this thinking that the world could somehow and in some way infect and make um, people flawed. But realizing what we do about original sin, realizing that none of us were born um, needing to learn how to sin, but all of us have that naturally within us, uh, we find that, that there's something about that that rings hollow. Um, when we talk about the world and not loving the world from 1 John 2, what we really mean, or what Scripture is really talking about is the system's the priorities, the way of thinking, the perspectives of a fallen world. We're not called to love that. We're not called to love all the different things the world, is, the world has to offer. But we are called to love the world when it comes to people. We are called to love the world because people are who occupy the world. And you know what? If people, if you think of evangelism in terms of, re, in terms of reaching people out there, some nameless, faceless, unidentified, anonymous mass of humanity out there, like voting blocks or people who believe that or people who believe this, the world is not going to be compelling to you in the sense that you're not going to want to share the gospel with people. But if there are names and faces in your mind when you think of what the world is, that's something different. See. When I think of the world, 
Um, and when we think of the world, we're all called to think of people. And we're all called to think of people who need to hear the gospel. See, for many years in my life, I, I never had any... I didn't think about sharing the gospel with unbelievers. And now my job being as it is, I don't get to mix with unbelievers at work like I used to. And so one of the things that I've had to try to do is pray that the Lord open doors and opportunities for me to be able to be around unbelievers. So that in my mind, world isn't just some mass of humanity out there. You know, like you know, when you go to Disneyland and there's just mass numbers of people and you look around, and you don't even try to register people at this place. You don't even try to look at faces. You don't even try to, try to engage with anybody because everybody's just going from ride to ride or thing to thing, and no one's interested in you. No one's looking at you. No one's even paying attention to you unless your kids are crazy. Um, and you just go about your business. And sometimes we can have that mentality when it, comes to, when it comes to our lives. Just we're going about our business. But recently I've been convicted that you know, that, that can't be. I've got different business to do. <laughs> and so we're going to ask the question, how do, first of all, we're going we're to find out how we can love the world. But before we do that, we're going to answer the question, how do I think about the world? How do I think about the world? So then we can answer the second question, how can I love the world? How do I think about the world? And how can I love the world? First, how do I think about the world? Look at verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, regard him, we regard him thus no longer. You know what that means? Regard somebody according to the flesh? That means size somebody up by the outside. Ultimately, that's what that means. We don't, Paul's telling us from, as he writes 2 Corinthians, regard people according to what they look like on the outside. Why? Because that's the way the world does it. Now, what does the world do? The world has you know, celebrity gossip news shows and puts out variety magazines. Um, they talk, they, there's all sorts of blogs and websites that put up and highlight not people's character, they highlight people's appearance and people's skill. So if it's musical or, or you know, if someone is particularly beautiful or if it's their ability to do something. So we don't go to sporting events to watch people play who don't know what they're doing. We put people up on a pedestal because they can either put a ball through a hole, hit a ball, or knock 10 of them over maybe in one, in one roll. We, we put those kind of people up on a pedestal, and none of that has anything to do with the, the amount of their character. And so what it, in, a, in a sense, what we're doing is regarding people by our culture, regards people in a fleshly sense. And Paul says, listen, don't point the finger at other people. Point your finger at yourself. Because remember, you used to regard Jesus that way. And you know what? All of us at one time, if you're, if you're a believer here, regarded Jesus just like that. It regarded Jesus as someone who was a good moral teacher, somebody who you know, had a lot of good things to say. He was a miracle worker, but he wasn't a savior for you. He was just some prophet from long ago. And Paul says we can't do that. We can't regard Jesus in that sort of fleshly way. Just as we can't regard people, regard people by their education, how much money they make, where they went to school, what house they live in, what their, um, what their accent's like, what the color of their skin is, any of that. We can't regard people like that. And in fact, if you read the Gospels over and over again, one of the resounding themes you see again and again is that people regard Jesus in a fleshly way. Remember, he, when he was doing his earthly ministry, he could feed four and 5,000 at the drop of a hat. And folks back then had to think hard about where their next meal was going to come from. And so many of them decided, hey, let's follow this guy. He's like a divine vending machine. And so... You just drop in a couple fishes and a few loaves and bam, you got a full meal. That is a good gig. And so you read the Gospels and you see Jesus again and again doing this, these miracles and people follow him because they want to eat, not because they want to hear. <laughs> and remember the teaching Jesus gives us, I think this is hilarious. I'd have loved to, to be there in the crowd, looking, not in the crowd, but looking at the crowd as Jesus taught this. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood to be my disciple. These are people who wanted to follow Jesus. And they wanted to follow Jesus because he could feed them. And they're looking at him thinking, yeah, your left arm doesn't look very appetizing to me. I'm not a cannibal. And I can just imagine when Jesus said that, people kind of looked to themselves and like, what? Now let's get out of here before we're fed fingers or something. Um, and you know what this, what this scripture says? Is pe- many people left because that was a hard teaching. <laughs> you think? <laughs> um, but the reason they left is because they regarded Jesus in a fleshly way. They regarded Jesus as what they could, they could look like, on the, what he looked like on the outside. He didn't do all the things that people in power and the intelligentsia did. He didn't go to any school. He didn't wear those robes. He didn't have a silly hat on. He stayed out in the country. He didn't go where the, thinking, the, the centers of thought were. He didn't go to Jerusalem or even to Rome until he, was, until he did for, to Jerusalem for, for worship. By the standards of the world, Jesus wasn't really that impressive at all. He was, Isaiah tells us, he wasn't a looker. No one could, he, he didn't have any beauty. Um, if you were to, if we had his 12 disciples and him in a lineup, you wouldn't be able to pick him out. He, he looked just like everybody else. He, he, he didn't do the things that, 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 brought, that brought notoriety, that brought importance in a physical sense. All he did was change the world by not just his teaching, but by rising again. And so when we think about sharing the gospel, first and foremost, not first and foremost, but first we need to make sure that we don't regard people in a worldly sense. You know what? We can drive the streets of Peoria or any other city in the United States and see people who look happy washing their cars, mowing their yard. We can see people who seem to have it all in big houses, who, have, who send their children to the best schools, who shop in Whole Foods kind of places and eat organically or whatever, and think they don't need anything. They look happy, but inside they're dying. See, what we do when we regard people by, the, by our five senses is that we, we do dishonor to God's word and we regard them in a fleshly sense. We regard them as someone who doesn't need anything because it seems as if their physical needs have all been met. See, it's easy to see the needs of people who are hungry and feed them. But everybody, everybody's born starving, not for food, but for spiritual nourishment and, and, and spiritual reality. And that's what, that's what we as Christians are called to do is minister to those people. And look at what Paul says as he highlights this in verse 17. Look there with me real quick. He says, therefore, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. See, when Paul uses, he's not, this isn't a throwaway term for him when he says new creation. This is an anticipation to the last day. On the last day, when the trumpet sounds and there's a new heaven and a new earth. Every, you read scripture, new heaven and new earth comes down from above. We're not going to build it up. We're not going to make things so good here to where Jesus goes, man, they did a good job, let's go back. No, that's not at all what happens. Instead, what, what we see is this reality being changed 180 degrees. Um, we see us still having bodies, but yet glorious bodies. Nature becomes completely and totally fixed. Because you can read in Romans that nature cries out even today for the, the effects of the curse to be reversed. And so when, when, when Paul says that, that, that believers are new creations, he's, he, he's, he's giving us a little foreshadowing of the radical nature of, of, of the new heaven and the new earth to come. See, none of us are going to say in heaven, you know what? It's kind of like it was back on earth, you know? We're not going to go, it's about the same. <laughs> no, I didn't see, I didn't drive on any golden streets on the way here. I didn't pass a glassy sea. Um, you know, I didn't see any angels. It, it's going to be a totally, radically, completely different existence. And Paul's saying, believers have the same thing. It's almost as if, 
Christians are as if it's as if they're they're portals to the to eternity, portals of eternity. Eternity, it, it's stuff, the stuff of eternity have been has been poured in us, as it were, as the Holy Spirit fills us and makes us new creations. We have more in common with the world to come than this world. That's why we don't feel at home ultimately anywhere we go, because we have more in common with a world that is not yet created. And so. Becoming a Christian, if you look at somebody on the outside, they're going to look exactly the same, but on the inside, they're going to be completely different. And so when we regard people as fleshly, what we're doing is we're demeaning the new creation. It's almost as if we're saying, you know, the new heaven, the new earth that Jesus says is going to come is going to be that different than what we, ex- what we have right now. It's saying, you know, I'm happy to live in this earth the way it is forever. That's pushing the analogy, but that's, we would, none of us would ever say that. That's not what, that's not at all. The old is gone, the new has come. We can see the same language in Revelation when John says, wow, there's stuff here I can't even describe. See, Christians, believers, are that radically different from everyone else. Now, that doesn't make us special at all. If you're not a believer here, I'm not saying that everybody who's a believer is more special than you. No, what I'm saying is that we're different because we have the Holy Spirit now residing within us. So ask yourself this question, what do you expect of heaven? Expect a totally different existence. As a believer, as a believer, how should you live when it comes to being and living and and, and mixing with unbelievers? How how do we do that? I I would suggest that we should be preaching the gospel in such a way, in such a way that We try to take as many people with us as we can. Look at verse 18. All of this, and when he means by that, he just means all the newness he's talking about, is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now Paul's going to describe what he means in verse 19. That is, Christ in God was Christ in God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of res- reconciliation. Us. That's our job. Message of reconciliation, the reconciliation of making, uh, of telling about Jesus Christ so that people might believe. That's our job now. It's not his job anymore in a physical sense, but it's our job. We're the ones who are meant to be the mouthpieces of Jesus Christ to people who don't believe. And so when you realize that, now there's lots of, when you realize that, we realize as believers that we're the only ones who have this. We're the only ones who can talk about Jesus like this. And so we have to do this. There's other people who can give political opinions. There's other people who can give good advice. There's other people who can, who can do things like that. Nobody else can preach the gospel. So in some sense, I'm not saying politics and alt traditions and, and those sorts of things aren't important. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have opinions about those things, but I am saying those things pale in comparison to what message we have the privilege to be able to give. The message, in fact, we're commanded to give because we have the message of reconciliation. And so when we think about our unbelieving friends, they don't need to know what you think about politically. Who cares? They don't need to know what you think about carbon footprints. They don't need to know what you think about when it comes to educating your kids. They don't need to know what you think about in terms of how to eat organically or whatever. They don't need to know what you think about when it comes to how to save money, how to spend money. They don't need to know what you think about when it comes to leisure and vacations. Those are okay things, but they need to know your Savior because you have the message of reconciliation. That's the only thing they really need to know. Now, If you talk politics to get to the gospel, great. If you talk whatever to get to the gospel, outstanding. But that's the only thing that they really need to know. They need to see and experience your love and hear the gospel. You do that, the world becomes becomes a place with names and faces and not just a mass of humanity. See, Christ is really, literally, making his appeal through us. It's as if, Christ is holding us up as a megaphone, saying, here's my appeal. It's the appeal of people who are once dead and now alive. It's the appeal of people who have a message to, to speak, and that message is the message of reconciliation, to say, you can have hope 
hope forever because Christ has died for you. So when we think about the world, we don't think about the world as people out there, but we think about the world as people that we're called to go and preach the message of reconciliation to. We're commanded to do that. So how do we love the world? Our second question. How do we love the world? Verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. So not only did he describe our job description in verses 18 and 19, but now we get a title. We're ambassadors. And if you think about what an ambassador is, it's somebody who lives in a foreign country and represents their home country. The only difference between us and ambassadors that come from France or Germany or Liechtenstein is that we've never been home yet. That's the only difference. We'll go there. That's where we belong. We're not familiar with all the nooks and crannies up there yet, but right now we're called to be here. And think about what an ambassador does every day. An ambassador is accosted with the reality that he or she is not home. Walking out onto the street, he or she hears language that's different than their homeland. They look at countryside that's different. There's traditions that are different. There's food that's different. Modes of communication are different. Um, There's people's customs and traditions are radically different. Weather may be different. Friendliness of the people may be different. What side of the street you drive on may be different. Everything screams you're not home. And there's a sense of restlessness in a good ambassador because that ambassador is thinking, man, I got to do my job, but I want to go home. I can't wait to be able to be back home, to be in my own homeland. You know what it's like if you've ever been out of the country? You go somewhere and you go, it was a fun experience, but I'm ready to go home. This is great, but I need to go home. And it, it, you can even go to some, I've been to Canada. Canada is still not America. If you're Canadian here, I'm sorry. Not, I'm sorry, not, not sorry that you're from Canada, but it, it's different. And, and I don't have to think, I don't think, wow, this is a lot like the United States. It feels so different. Everything. A boat and all kinds of stuff. Hockey and whatever. It just feels strange, even though they speak the same language purportedly. Um, it's just different. Um, my dad talked about, he went to Bolivia and he talked about how they love llamas and they have this deal where they have like llama fetus week or month or something with the bus drivers or something. So there's llama fetuses all over Bolivia. Now, if I'm an American ambassador to Bolivia, I'm thinking, yeah, I, I want to get out of here because it's going to stink. I don't want to see the llama fetuses. It's all bad all the way around. See, as believers, we're ambassadors just the same. We're ambassadors just the same. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what kind of an ambassador are we? That's the question we all have to ask ourselves. Are we an ambassador for Christ or are we an ambassador for something else? What kind of an ambassador are we? Is there people, are there people that we are making an appeal to for Christ? Or not? It, it's not acceptable biblically to not have people that we're working, praying, talking, sharing the gospel to and with. It's, it, it's not, because we're ambassadors. Now, an ambassador doesn't describe our whole job description when it comes, uh, when it comes to being a Christian. We're still disciples. We're still sons and daughters. We still have a God to glorify, which means we read the Bible, we pray, we have fellowship with other believers. But that's not to minimize the fact that we're all called to be ambassadors. And this isn't a gifting thing. This is not about spiritual gifts. We can't say that someone's gifted evangelistically. Maybe they are, but that doesn't give us the right and privilege to say, well, I'll leave it to them. Any more than we can say, you know what, I'm not gifted to pray. I'm going to leave that to those that can pray. Or I'm not gifted to read my Bible. I'm going to leave that to the people who can do that better than I. Or I'm not gifted to fellowship. No, we would never say that. 
I mean, the bottom line is, is that who will tell him if we don't? We're the only ambassadors here. Not, I mean, not Grace Church, not Sovereign Grace Church, but Christians. And, and it's a relatively small group. There's about 40 million evangelical Christians in a country of better than 300 million. If you think about it in terms of missions, we're one of the top 10 unreached people groups, Americans. 260 million people aren't Christians. America receives more missionary, both sends and receives more missionaries than any other nation in the world. So it's as if the rest of the world's aware of something here that we're not. 2000, we received 33,000 missionaries from other countries coming so that they could share the gospel here to America. Now, that's not to say we that's not to say that missionaries from our country to other nations is bad, but it is to say that there is a mission field out there that other nations see that we don't often. I don't. So we need to ask ourselves, what kind of an ambassador are we? There's lots of different kinds we could be. Here's three. First, we're like naturalized. It, it, there's... there's there's one ambassador that can blend in, but yet not represent. Like, you're almost becoming a naturalized citizen. Blend in and not represent. Um, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's, the, it, it's, it's people who, in the name of evangelism, can blend in so much and become so like the world that there's nothing different about them. And there's nothing that they have that's any different than the world. And that's deadly. So we can't blend in so much that the world can't look at us and go, you know, there's something different about you. That, that's, not, that's not an option. We're called to love the world but not lose ourselves. See, Jesus hung around the worst people, but that didn't make him, he didn't sin. When it comes to worst people when, in, in the New Testament, you see this phrase, it was around sinners and tax collectors. Sinners were prostitutes. So imagine, imagine a teacher having, wherever he went to people's homes, kind of a following of prostitutes. <laughs> what would you think? Be a little odd. And tax collectors. So they were traitors. Traitors because the Jew, they were tax collectors for the Roman Rome. And Rome was an oppressive, evil outside force. And so all the religious elite saw Jesus mixing with these people and said, that is out of bounds. But Jesus didn't just mix with them to be like them. He shared the God. He told them of the, king, the coming kingdom. He told them of himself. So he loved them and shared truth. And that's what we're called to do. There's no place that we can't go, that we can't take Christ with us. Wherever we are, we're called to be there for Christ. Wherever we are, that's we're called to be there for Christ. And we can't so blend that we don't stand out. We're always going to be different. It's as if, like I talked to a guy today who had an accent. And I knew he wasn't from here. It's not because he was saying, um, you know, I'm from another country. His very manner and language told me he was from another country. And in a sense, that's what it's like for us as believers. We're called to have a manner and a sense about ourselves that is from another place because we represent another world. So not only so do we, not, we don't want to blend in and not stand out, but also we don't want to blend in and we, we don't want to not blend in and not represent. We don't want to just so be so isolated, kind of have a militia member mentality where you know we live out in the desert and don't interact with anybody because well, we're in the desert, but we're, we are called to interact with people. We're not supposed to be so isolated so that we don't have in, so that we're never in, in contact with any unbelievers. And see, this is something you all are doing. You're, you're here. You're, you're, you're thinking about what it means to share the gospel with unbelievers because, because. You went on a church plant, many of you, from our church. And that's super commendable, but... And, and you know what? I, I've talked to guys who... Uh, churches who've started off, and in the beginning, it's, 
hey, yeah, we need to reach out, we need to invite people, let's make sure that we have this, this identity where we're always reaching out, where we're always looking to serve, where we're always trying to share the gospel with unbelievers. And then as the church grows, and then there's other programs, and there's a the youth group, and then there's singles, and then there's small groups and things like that. Evangelism becomes something that, wow, that was fun back in the day, but, but it can't be that way. It can't be that way for any church. Um, so we can't, we can't be so isolated that we can't make an impact for people. See, we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. We're called to love the world, but yet not make an idol of the world. We're called to see the world as a place that is nothing more than a harvest field because we are from another country. See, when we don't blend in, we're not going to love the world. We're going to look at them as enemies who hold opposing views and who are making our society go downhill. Jesus didn't do that when he looked at Jerusalem in Matthew 23. He said, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you would not. He wept as he said those things. And he knew every name in that city. He knew every face. He knew every story. He knew every person's perspective. He knew every person's point of view. He knew every person's environment, reality. He knew all of that. But yet, but yet, and he wept. See, the world for Jesus was never something that was just out there, but it was always something that was in his heart. If your heart doesn't break for the world, just get to know people. Have unbelievers in your home. I mean, I have a friend who, who I've been, this is a long process, I've been interacting with this friend for now six years about what it means to be a Christian. Um, and just to be and talk to him, I, he just doesn't have, he, I've shared the gospel, he just doesn't have that, over, he just, he's not a believer, and so you see the way he puts his life together. It's different, and it, he's frustrated, and he doesn't have peace. He's trying to find answers in all different ways. And so I, as an ambassador, have to continue to tell him, hey, there's a better country. This isn't all there is. I need to mix in. We all need to mix in. So we can't be so separated that we don't impact. We can't be so like that we that we don't impact. Also, thirdly, we can't be so busy that we don't do anything. See, that's like an ambassador who's ready to retire or ready maybe for a reassignment, to put it nicely, to put it bluntly, ready to get fired, maybe, um, as the country is like, are you representing us anymore? We keep saying, represent us in this way or that way, but yet nothing happens there. And that's sadly, that's the way we go. We get busy with Children, we get busy with grandchildren, we get busy with school, we get busy with jobs, we get busy with work, we get busy with projects at home, we get busy with car repairs, we get busy with our hobbies, we get busy with the books we read, the books we write, we get busy with whatever we do, forgetting we're ambassadors, forgetting that we're called to be here on behalf of Christ, forgetting that it's as if God in Christ is making his appeal through us. That's our message, and this is a message no one else has. A friend of mine this week sent me a, a clip um, to this of, I don't know, there's, I don't know who he is. He's a um, comedian in, or a magician or something in um, Las Vegas. Penn and Teller or somebody like that. He has like long hair, and he does these video blogs, and he's an avowed, strict, Complete and total atheist. Total atheist. Somebody, I'll show you the clip. Someone at one of his shows, he'll describe it, comes up and gives him a Bible. And what he says is fascinating. It's something we as believers, because as believers we think, oh my goodness, how could I ever share the gospel well enough or smart enough or in such a way so that somebody who's an atheist who doesn't even believe in the existence of God, how could that they could care? Well, he has a point in this video which I find compelling. And as ambassadors, as fellow ambassadors, I want to share it with you. So, do I need to do anything or? Nope. 
I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I get home from the show, and at the end of the show, uh, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we uh, we talk to folks and you know sign an occasional autograph and shake hands and so on. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the um, what I call the hover position after I was all done. Big guy, probably about my age. Big guy. And um, he had been the, um, the guy who has uh, picks the joke during our psychic comedian section of the show. Uh, so we had the props from that in his hand because we'd give those away. He had the the joke book and the and the envelope and the paper and stuff. If you haven't seen the live show, I, uh, it's not worth explaining. But he had props from the show that we'd given him from the night before. Uh, he wasn't the guy that night. And he walked over to me and he said, um, I was here last night at the show. And uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted, and he was very complimentary about my use of language and... Um, complimentary about, you know, honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff. No reason to go into it. He said nice stuff. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition. Um, I thought it said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? Or, uh, Psalms from the New, just part of the New Testament little book about this big, this thick, you know. He said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of uh, proselytizing. And then he said, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane. I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. And... Uh, it was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. But this guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, liked your show and so on, and then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know there's no God, and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Uh, but I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man, and uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave you that book. That's all I wanted to say. How much <laughs> did they hate me to not tell me? An atheist. Did you notice how many times he talked about sanity? 
and just being nice. I think we're insane when we, you know, don't act real. We don't have a real, just a normal way of interacting with him or people. That's what this guy did. He reacted, he he acted in a normal way. But the thing that jumped out at me, which I'm sure jumped out at you, is that statement, how much must you hate me if you don't proselytize? How much? And this is a lot more important than a truck hitting somebody in the side of the road. I mean, he, he nailed it. Even though he doesn't know the true and living God and he doesn't think he exists. He got it right. When, there's going to be time. We need to tackle some people. <laughs> you know, I'm tackling people who go to, who are in hospitals. Um, and, and, you know, maybe there's a time where we tackle people. But, see, he doesn't know the truth. But somebody was faithful to share the truth with him. Or at least give him a Bible. That man was living in an amb- as an ambassador. So we're called to do too. See, we're called to love other people in such a profound way that our hearts melt for them and their souls. Not for our perspectives, our timelines, our points of view. Not because maybe they look differently or smell differently or act differently. Or because they're from a different society or a different background. But that they need Jesus because, and, and they need to know that there is a better place, another country. That's our message. The message that Jesus Christ offers entry to a wonderful new place. And that entry is upon pain of death. Not our death, but Jesus' death. That entry was bought by a man who really lived, who really died, and who is really alive, and he's going to come back. And we can love people enough to be able to tell them this truth. And you know what? We don't need all the apologetic information in the world, all we need is credible, it's just a credible testimony. Like even this man had in just the moments he talked to Penn, just, just the moments he, he gained credibility. He wasn't crazy, he wasn't insane. And we need the guts to be able to do it, and we're not going to have guts if we don't love people who are unbelievers. We're not. And you know what we need? We need to remember that the power of the gospel is what saves people. Not the, not the, the snazziness of our argument. Not if you can explain the difference between infra and superlapsarianism. Or if you can decide to, 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 to parse all the different philosophical arguments that are out there. Or if you can take every, every fourth genitive from the left or anything like that. What they need to hear is that there's a, a loving God who is looking to add people to his flock. Because everybody's dying for that news. And the gospel is powerful. My all-time favorite gospel sharing story comes from the 18th century when George Whitfield, if, you if you've never heard of George Whitfield, he was one of the most powerful evangelists that in the English-speaking world has ever seen. And he evangelized in the United States. He was from England, came over here, and evangelize up and down the eastern seaboard because that was all there was back then. There were, wasn't the United States, it was the colonies. Um, and uh, Whitfield, really, his preaching and his manner was the spark that began the Great Awakening. Um, and so Whitfield would gather crowds that were like 10,000 strong outside. And he had this little podium that was, you know, about that tall. And he would stand on his podium and preach. He preached from memory. And so whenever you're in front of 10,000 people, I would assume, you're going to be more gregarious, you're going to be more animated. Because, you know, the crowd goes back half a mile, maybe. Especially in those times. It wasn't as if he was in amphitheaters. He's just in open-air meadows preaching. In fact, Benjamin Franklin said you could hear his voice a mile away. So he was gifted to be able to project. God gifted, gifted him with preaching and also the ability to project his voice. I'm sure he didn't have an inside voice. Um, but that's beside the point. Um, he was an easy target. He was a guy who was a little odd looking. He, um, was, he, he was cross-eyed, and people would make fun of him because of the way he you know, had trouble focusing or whatever. Um, 
In fact, if you look at old statues of them, you can kind of pick it up in the statue with, as they try to represent the eyes, but the eyes are never right in statues. Um, that's beside the point also. Um, I keep doing all these things beside the point. But there was this group of people who followed him wherever he went called the Hellflower, Hellfire Club. And they were led by a guy named Thorpe. And this club would hang out to, to Whitfield's right or left, down in the front, and Thorpe had the best Whitfield impersonation. He could mock him and do all his hand motions and sort of do that. So when Whitfield was up proclaiming and moving his arms and you know, getting into his, his preaching, Thorpe is down here doing the same thing. Well, the Hellfire Club said, you know, we had a fun time mocking Whitfield this time, and so let's go into a tavern and do it again. And so what Thorpe did <laughs> was he memorized one of Whitfield's sermons. Okay. And so what he was going to do in that tavern was stand there and be Whitfield. Cross his eyes, move his arms, say the words. They go to the tavern, the Hellfire Club, drinking it up. Thorpe, they mock him, they mock Whitfield. Thorpe stands up. I don't know his first name. The book's not, the book doesn't give us his first name, so we'll just call him Thorpe. Thorpe stands up, begins to mock Whitfield, and mock, mock preaches him, mock preaches. And as he considers the words that he's mocking, and, and the message that, that Whitfield had been proclaiming, he realizes that he's a sinner and that he needs a savior. And right then he stopped and in tears left and became a Christian right there from his own preaching. That is the power of the gospel. It's not the power of, that's not anybody's personality changing anyone. You know what? You have the same gospel Whitfield did. You have it. I have it. We have the same call to go to people who are right now dead. They don't know it, but they're dead. They don't have any concept of the fact that they're dead. But we have a message that's like a megaphone that pierces death and goes beyond the grave and says, there's life. And that message the message of our Savior, Jesus Christ, because we as ambassadors, we're called to give it. And you're an ambassador wherever you go, your workplace, your school, your family, your friends, wherever you are, you're there for Christ. And you've got that gospel too. So I can guarantee you, not because of anybody's ability, but because the gospel is still powerful. And because the Lord still saves people, that there will be people that you tell the truth of Jesus Christ to who right now have no interest at all in thinking anything at all about Grace Church except nothing, who will come and become part of this church because of you sharing the gospel, you just being a faithful ambassador saying, hey, you need to know about Jesus. And I know that one day, someday, a room bigger than this will be filled with people who are once dead and now alive. That's our prayer. So, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask for opportunity. Lord, we know that you have blessed us with the privilege of being your children. We know that you've given us the honor of living for you. And Lord, I pray that you would allow us to be able to, to know, Lord, those who you've called us to reach out to. And Lord, I pray that you would give us opportunity to share the gospel. And Lord, I pray, Lord, I, I feel like the Lord would, would encourage us to just be thinking of people right now, names and faces in your mind of people who are not Christians. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait for a few seconds to give you an opportunity just to quietly pray to yourself. To quietly consider who the Lord may, who, whose life you're in for the purpose of the gospel. You can pray that they would hear and believe.
Lord, we've all got names. And Lord, you know the names and their faces. You know everything about those people. And we pray for opportunity to share the gospel. And Lord, we pray for more people, to, for us to know more people who are unbelievers so that we can share the gospel with them. We pray that they would be impacted forever like we have been. Lord, bring us, bring us, Lord, we know the words to speak, Lord, but give us opportunity and the people to share it with. And Lord, I pray for Grace Church, Lord, that you would make a mark of this church the strength of their evangelism, Lord. I pray that there would be people walking in this door, and the door at the Rio Vista, who, who right now hate you. I pray that this would be a melting pot of people from all kinds of backgrounds all kinds of socioeconomic classes, all kinds of different perspectives, gathering together, not because, they, not, not because of any other reason, but because they've been bought with the blood of Christ. But I pray that this, would be a, this church would put forward a story to the surrounding area, the story being, you know, those Christians get along where we don't get along even like, like that. And Lord Jesus, I pray that that would be the narrative over Grace Church, Lord. The people be astounded at the way the believers in that church get along and the way that they love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.